Well, this seems like a good moment. Good morning. This side's very quiet. This is the herd of squirrels that has to calm down. They're all ready. Got notebooks out and everything. Oh, I need you. Lord, I need you. Every hour I need thee. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much that you have cut through space and time and have given us the gift of your son, Jesus Christ, that at just the right time, Lord, that you sent him, he who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might be the righteousness of God. Thank you, Lord, for saving us for in our desperation and our lostness that you spoke to us in our rebellion and running from you that you wooed us and that you ultimately scooped us up and adopted us as your own lord we have such a special relationship with you and it's not because of our worthiness it's not because of anything that we might become but it's because of your goodness that leads us to repentance Thank you, Lord, for this day. Those who have gathered here, those who have made the choice to get up and come here, I trust that you'd give us hungry hearts, that you'd help us to hear your voice, that as your children we might grow to be like you. You might help us to do business with you, knowing that we come before a loving Father. So, Lord, we present ourselves to you this morning as your children, as your creations, as those who are special projects. Lord, help us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as you know, we're back in the book of Genesis today. We've been looking at the uh, wild, wild world of uh, our forefathers those who have come to faith and understood who God is and have walked with him and God's interaction. We've been looking specifically at Abraham's line and going down to Isaac and Isaac to Jacob. The story's going to pick up from Jacob and go forward. So you're going to notice that the pace of Genesis kind of picks up because it's narrative. So there's a lot of explanation and I, I get, I feel like I'm kind of in storytelling mode. So uh, I, I just get to stand up here and tell you a story that you've already read, which is, why do you pay me? I don't understand. <laughs> We're going to talk about Jacob and how he's running away from, he's running away and yet he's found by God. Any of you relate? You know what it is to run away and be found by God. Uh, what, a, what a great, great thing that is. Uh, just to remind you where you are. So recently in Genesis, we've been looking at the family of Abraham. We saw Jacob and Esau. Uh, Jacob, we know, was a mild man who dwelt in tents, and Esau, who was a hairy man, and that's why they called him Esau, because Esau means hairy, and he was red. Um, so, and he was a man's man. He was a hunter. He went out and got game for his father, and he and his father shared that uh, love of satisfying the appetite, and so Esau becomes the favorite. And so we saw this favoritism began to happen in the family and, you know, where Jacob was a mama's boy and Esau was daddy's man and all of that separation and what it causes in the family. And yet overarching all of this is God's sovereignty and his foreknowledge of understanding what he wants to do and how he wants to act. We saw Isaac moving around from place to place and he, he redigs the wells of his father and and then the people of the area don't like him being there, and so they come and argue over the rights. And so he just moves. He finds another well. And uh, he digs another well, and the people argue about that one. And finally, he digs a third well, and they didn't say anything about that. And you would think that it was all over, but he finally goes to a place, Bathsheba, where he's able to dig a well, and he meets with God. And that's where he stays. And the lesson for me was, you know, you want to stay where God is because you can find water anywhere. You know, the Lord will make you prosper anywhere that you decide to go. But if you go there without him, it's not even worth staying. Amen? And then we looked at last week about what it is to steal God's favor, which, of course, that was a tongue-in-cheek way of me making an interesting title to make you scratch your head in that one little bald spot right there. 
That's just for me, I suppose. Stealing God's favor, and how does that work? How does God overarchingly work in his sovereignty, even through the duplicity and lying of human beings? I find it amazing in the years that I've walked with the Lord, how he takes all of my mistakes and frailties and shortcomings and stupidity, and he works it together for good anyway, which is a remarkable recycling program, better than anything we have. And I'm, I'm just so grateful for that. And so we looked at the stealing, how Jacob and his mother collude to steal this blessing, this overarching blessing from God, which, by the way, God's in charge of, although he delegates to us to give. Um, it's interesting. I don't know too many people that practice this blessing anymore. And yet there's something to be said for parents speaking to their children, things that they see God at work in. There's something very empowering about that. So if you have kids at home, your words are incredibly powerful in the lives of your kids, um, and you can speak blessing into them, hopefully led by the Spirit of God to do so. So Jacob pretends to be Esau. He's wearing goat skin because his mom, you know, is making food, and he's getting, you know, dead skins put on him, and he's going up to try to deceive his blind father to think he's his brother, which he's not. And four times he says, are you really my son? <laughs> Are you really, Esau? Four times, come closer, let me smell you. One of the most interesting things that I didn't even mention last week is the father ultimately gives the blessing to the younger, non-favored child instead of the loved son, who was Esau, according to him, because he was wearing his clothes. And he says, come, come, let me, let me kiss you, my son. And he gets him close, he feels his neck, and it's hairy like a goat or like Esau. But he smells his clothes and he goes, ah, this is my son Esau. Do you understand the way that we get the blessing of the fathers? Because we're wearing the favored elder son clothes. One of the things I didn't mention last week because we didn't have time. And we're running out now. So moving on. <laughs> this week, we're going to talk about running from God and, and being found by him. Beginning in verse 1, chapter 28, it says, Then Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and charged him and said to him, You shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. Arise, go to Padan Aram, to the house of Bethuel, your mother's father, and take yourself a wife from there of the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. Now you may find this unusual that he says you should go find a cousin to marry. Apparently, none of you find that amazing. Okay. There are parts of the world where that's all they do, and there are problems now with our gene pool. But back then, it wasn't a big deal. It's always best to find somebody that is related to your father. Yeah, I, I'll tell you what, my, my wife has a relationship with the living God. And so if, if I'm not good with her, then I'm not good with her dad, who happens to be mine as well. I knew I knew it would come through at some point in time. What he's saying is this principle not to be unevenly yoked, not to get into a relationship with a wife who is not a believer. These people in Canaan are worshiping idols and he says, I, I don't want you with any of them. And the reason he said that is because his wife said, don't let him marry these women. Get him out of here. And so that's what he did. And he goes, I got to live with her. So get out of here. Go find a wife. And sends him out. Wants him to be yoked evenly instead of what his brother did. And one wasn't enough. He had to have two. Um, you know, I guess he was collecting one of every kind. But he kept them all in one kind. It's about being yoked together. That little thing that you see on the necks of those animals is called a yoke. It keeps them together. And uh, hopefully you get two animals of similar strength and uh, of the same stock so that they can pull a nice straight line. And none of you probably are farmers here, but to pull a plow, you want it nice and straight so you can plant, plant straight furrows. And if they're, not uneven, if they're unevenly yoked, what ends up happening is you just go in circles, which... Crop circles might be cool on the internet, but they're not good for planting. In 2 Corinthians in the New Testament, we're told about this too. We're told in the Old Testament, in fact, you're not supposed to take two different types of cloth and mix them together. 
You're not supposed to take linen and cotton and mix it together. You're not supposed to take two different, and you go, why is God so concerned with mixing of these things? Well, there's a deeper thing behind that. You don't mix these animals together. You don't mix these cloths together. And you, as a people, are to come apart and be separate, says the Lord. And that's the whole point of it. In uh, 2 Corinthians 6, Paul, writing to the Corinthians, says this, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? Uh, The implied answer is nothing at all. And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Baal or, or Baal or Baal? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God and idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. So, What Isaac's saying is, you need to go. You need to go and get yourself a good girl because the neighborhood we're in, not a place you want to go. Now, I don't know how many of you shopped for your wife. You may have found her online, probably not at Amazon. But it's interesting, the places where I used to try to dig and find well and find water, um, uh, watering holes, that's why they call them that. And It wasn't a good place to be able to find a wife. I can tell you, I found my wife at a Bible study. (laughs) Go where the water is. That's what I would tell you men and ladies. So, unequal yoking can be a real pain in the neck. It can be a real problem because the older, uh, the larger animal will end up dragging the weaker animal and you're never going to get a straight furrow and what you're going to do is have one overwhelmed animal and one abused animal and it just never works out and and the and like i said crop circles aren't really cool for planting so he's saying don't marry don't no 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 don't do it don't marry one of these women the best yoke to get in by the way is with jesus because jesus said here in Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 to 30. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. His yoke is easy, his burden is light, because he's the one doing all the work. Get in a yoke with Jesus, and he does all the work for you. All you have to do is really stop running away. That's the biggest thing that we do. Amen? Amen. It's interesting, he says here, and for you are the temple of the living God. Uh, You know, there's a lot of talk today in in the society about your body being a temple, and they've kind of grabbed this out of Scripture and, you know, said, well, your, your body's a temple. Okay, well, what's that mean? No, that means my whole life's journey is to worship the temple. No, no, no. That's not what a temple's for. A temple's so that you can worship God, right? A temple isn't so that you can worship the temple. That's called an idol. So you might say that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit because the, the Bible is very clear about that, but it does, a temple isn't to be worshipped. It's for worship of God. And people have it the other way around, and it's all about, you know... I have to measure all my food and I have to measure the calories and I have to watch what I put on. I have to watch on the internet and make sure I'm up to date on common fashions and, you know, where the sales are. And I, 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 It's all about me. Well, a temple is for worshiping God. And if you're going through all of that work and you're not worshiping God, then it's idolatry. So he says that your body is the temple, which is interesting. And to the Jews, that would mean something, wouldn't it? In 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, Paul writing to the Corinthians says, or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? And you are not your own, for you were bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which is God's. It also says that we're not to grieve the Holy Spirit of God in which we have been sealed into the day of redemption. That the Spirit of God is God's deposit. He put himself in us. 
And we're not to grieve the Holy Spirit, which means when, when I sin and I do stupid things, I drag him with me. And the Holy Spirit has to be drugged through all of the stupid things I do. If my thoughts and the intentions of my heart and the words of my mouth, the activity of my hands, if they're not glorifying to God, I drag God, the Holy Spirit, through all that. That's why it says don't grieve the Holy Spirit. And by the way, it's one of those verses that shows that the Holy Spirit's a person, not an it or a thing. Because you can't grieve an it or a thing. But you can grieve a person. It's the person of the Holy Spirit. You're the temple of God. A temple is for several things. The purpose of the temple was to meet with God in sacrifice, celebration, and worship. I can't think of anything else. It's a place where you go and you present yourself as a leper and say, look, I've been cleansed. And you offer sacrifices of praise and worship unto God. That's what a temple is. So my life is to be a place of sacrifice. My life, my life is to be a place of worship and thanksgiving unto God because Christ has already made the ultimate sacrifice of himself. So what, what's the activity of your temple today? You know, we, we spend a lot of time on our temples, you know, washing and cleaning and feeding and combing and grooming and all of that. At least some of us do. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. You are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. I'm preaching to myself because I'm on a diet. <laughs> Verse 3. Jacob is, is being blessed by his father Isaac. Isaac obviously gotten over the deception and realizes this is what God wanted from the beginning. And he's suddenly on board after he had his little tremor situation. Verse 3. May God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you that you may be an assembly of peoples and give you the blessing of Abraham to you and your descendants with you that you may inherit the land in which you are a stranger, which God gave to Abraham. So Isaac sent Jacob away and he went to Padam Aram and to Laban, the son of Bethuel, the Syrian, the brother of Rebekah, the mother of Jacob and Esau. Just in case you got him confused with any other Laban in the story, there's this long descriptive of all his relationships and who this Laban is. Uh, getting a last name is always a more helpful thing, I find. But uh, this, is, this is what they did. And it's interesting, in this blessing of his son, there's this prophecy that he's going to be back. I'll be back. He's going to be coming back and he's going to possess the land that God promised through Abraham. And so... He's going to be back. By the way, he's not going across town. This is where they are at Beersheba. And he travels this road all the way up to Haran, where he's going to find Laban, a total of 550 miles. Now, I don't know if you've ever taken a trip on your own, on foot, for 550 miles. I don't know if you've gotten in a car and driven 550 miles. 50 miles. That's a lot of miles. They're essentially saying goodbye. And because of this little stunt, Esau's hot on his trail, wants to kill him. As soon as dad kicks the bucket, he's going to take him out. And so they got to get this kid out of town. And they may as well send him to go get a wife from a place where they know they'll find a good one. And so he gives him this blessing and sends him away. It's the last time that Rebecca will ever see him and says goodbye to him, which tells me that there are circumstances that we can make mistakes and God will forgive us, but there might be long-standing side effects from what we do. And she has to send her son away to go find a wife and she'll never see him again. So and remember, she said, if you just go away for a few days, well, how long do you think it's going to take to go 550 miles on foot? You're not going away for a few days. It ends up being over 20 years. And we're going to, and that opens up a whole can I won't get into. Verse 6. Esau saw that Jake, at Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him away to Padan Aram, 
to take himself a wife from there, and that he had blessed him and gave him a charge saying, you shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. Well, that's got to sting a little bit because he had already married two. And that Jacob had obeyed his father and his mother had gone, uh, and his mother, and had gone to Paddan Aram. Also, Esau saw that the daughters of Canaan did not please his father Isaac. So Esau went to Ishmael and took Mahalath, the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son, the sister of Nebajoth, to be his wife in addition to the wives he had. What? <laughs> Told Jacob to go. Go get a good wife. Mom and dad don't like my pick of wives. Wait till they get a load of the third one. I'm going to Ishmael and pick me up another one. Bitter much? That is a really bad, bad reason to get married, don't you think? I'm going to get married because she's going to really, really upset my dad and mom. Oh my goodness, don't do it. Right? Ladies, don't find a guy that offends your father. Not a good reason to marry him. His name is Spike. He's 65 years old, owns a Harley Davidson, and you're 22. That'll do it. Don't do it. Anyway, so he says, I know what I'll do. I'll get a third one. Really? I mean, how else can we interpret this? No, you can't interpret it any other way. There's no other way to see this. He's just rotten. He's just angry. He's mean. Show something about your heart when you have to marry a third woman to upset your mother and father. Proverbs 17:11 comes to mind. An evil man seeks only rebellion. Therefore, a cruel messenger will be sent against him. <laughs> that cruel messenger is probably his third wife. How loved does she feel? One of, th she's number three of three. We'll give her a number. Ah, I'm sorry. I have so much more to say, but I can't say it. Now Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran. And so he came to a certain place and he stayed there all night because the sun had set. And he took one of the stones in a, of, it, of that place, and he put it at his head, and he lay down in a place to sleep. Now, you have to understand, he's on his own. He's running away from his brother so he doesn't die. He's going to a place he's never been, he's only heard of, and he's going there to meet his family, his distant family, and hopefully find a wife. Now, if you remember, it's very similar to what happened with his dad, except there was a servant who was sent to do all this. He's got to do it on his own. He's in an arid place. He's going through arid lands, and we're going to see where he ends up stopping for the night. You don't, you know, there's no, <laughs> there's no hotels, motels. There's, he's in the middle of nowhere by himself, and he finds a rocky hill, and he decides, I'm going to spend the night here. And he curls up with a rock. Have you ever lived through an experience like this? You ever been utterly and completely alone? I mean, not even like, this is so much worse than forgetting your phone. <laughs> utterly and completely alone in the middle of an arid place, by yourself, going to a place you've never been to meet people you don't know, to marry somebody you don't know. And you can't go home because your brother's going to kill you. And you're known as a deceiver, and yet your father blessed you and sent you off. This is where he is. I don't know about you, but I've been there. I've been alone. Been alone with my thoughts and my mistakes and my past and the people I've hurt and the wreckage I leave in my wake, and I'm suddenly alone. That's a good place to be. It's miserable, but it's a good place to be because that's where God begins to do business. 
with our hearts, right? You don't have to go there. But sometimes we do, and sometimes it's necessary. Forrest Gump was that way once. His mama told him he's always got to go put the past behind him before you can move on. And so that's what Jacob did. Uh, he just kept running. <laughs> I read through stories about Jacob, you know, and I think about people like Forrest Gump. And he just wanted to run away from his problems, and so from then on, he just ran everywhere he went. <laughs> Jacob is a deceiver, and he's going to run. And he's going to continue to run for the rest of his life because that's how he deals with stuff. He runs away. Trouble? Somebody wants to kill you? Run away. Don't deal with it. Don't iron it out. Don't apologize. Don't confess. Just run away. You know, sometimes it's a good idea to run away like Joseph did. But if, it's, if it is the canvas of your life and you use the biggest brush to paint, it's not going to be good. But see, God is there and catches up with him. I also thought of one other person who was running. If you watch The Hobbit, if you remember, this is Samwise Ganji who goes, um, this is it. If I take one more step, I'll be the furthest away from home I've ever been. And I can't help but think that that's how Jacob felt. This is the furthest away from home he's ever been. He's never been this far before, and I think it was at that point, uh, I looked at the map, he'd never been any further away from home than he was at this moment in time, and he's curled up with a rock. I don't know if you've ever tried to sleep with a rock under your head, but it's, it's not really the best thing to, to sleep on. So it's interesting because when people run, they're either running from something or they're running towards something but they're always running with someone. And that someone's God, obviously. And no matter where you go, the Lord's going to be there. Even in this dry place, sleeping on a rock. And so he's sleeping on a rock. By the way, the place is called Bethel, which means house of God. And this is actually where it is. This is, uh, this is built by Christians. This is built by Muslims. Uh, two different time periods, two different ages, but this is Bethel, and it's up on a hill. It's up on this great hill, and there's nothing but rock and weed uh, in this place. And this is where he spends the night. And Bethel has an interesting history from here on. This is one of the places where Abraham put an altar, and he called on the living God. It wasn't called that. It was called Luz at the time. But Abraham's been in this place, and he spent some time with God here. So just so that you can see what the inside looks like. There's actually a tomb here. There's somebody buried here. They wanted to be buried in the house of God. And so that's what happened. So they say a clean conscience makes for a soft pillow. Have you ever heard that? When you lay your head down at night and you have a clean conscience, it makes for a very soft pillow and for a good sleep. He's sleeping on a rock. I think that's fairly indicative of what's going on inside of his head. I don't know that he's resting very much. I think he's having to live with what he's done. And then he dreamed. And behold, a ladder was set up on the earth, and its top reached to heaven. And there the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. Now, that's a pretty interesting dream. Must have been a pretty decent ladder for them to be going up and down. So in the middle of him being alone, in the middle of him being in a dark place, the cold, sleeping on a rock, he has this dream of angels ascending, which, by the way, you, you can't ascend as an angel unless you've already descended, and it's mentioned first on purpose. You see, God is in this place, and God is at work in his life, but he doesn't know it. He feels completely and absolutely alone, and yet he isn't. And all he can think about is everything that's probably gone on behind him or anything that's gone on before. He has no relationship with God at all up to this point. We have no information about him ever meeting God or God meeting him. We know Isaac does. We know that Abraham does, but not him. Here's the picture of somebody who's just unconverted, 
Or maybe he was brought up in the church and knows all the stories, but he doesn't have a relationship. God is initiating a relationship with Jacob. And it all started with him being completely alone. And God was able to speak to him. I would encourage you guys to do that. Get completely alone. Shut your phone off. Don't turn the radio on. Be quiet. Be still and know that I am God. You will find him there. Or rather, you will be found by him there. It's interesting in the New Testament, Jesus brings us a little light on this in John chapter 1, verses 47 to 51. And Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom is no deceit, which sounds very sarcastic. But Nathanael said to him, Well, how do you know me? Apparently he thought Jesus wasn't being sarcastic. And Jesus answered and said to him, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered and said to him, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Which seems a little dramatic without a backstory. And so Jesus answered and said to him, because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, most assuredly, I say to you, hereafter, you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Isn't that interesting? I'll ask you a trivial question. When did Nathanael see angels ascending and descending on Jesus? Scour your minds. Nathaniel wasn't there yet, but that's good. You get points for that. <coughs> what Jesus is trying to say is, Jesus is the ladder. He's not the one that gets descended upon. He's the one who the angels descend on. You see, Jesus is the connection between heaven and earth because there is no other man there is no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. Jesus is the only gate. It's interesting. He says, I am the door. He says, I am the gate. He refers to all of these things and he says, I'm the ladder. I'm the connection between heaven and earth. There is no other mediator between man and God other than the man, Jesus Christ, the scripture teaches. Jesus says, I'm the ladder. Isn't that interesting? So there's a connection here to Genesis. And I have a feeling that it may have had something to do with what Nathaniel was reading underneath the fig tree. Otherwise, why would Jesus say that strange, arcane, out of the, out of the woods thing like that? If you watch The Chosen, which, by the way, I find very entertaining, they actually have one possible um, connection to that, and it's actually done very, very well. And it also explains why Nathaniel was so blown away by Jesus saying, I saw you under the fig tree. Oh, well, they knew the son of God because you saw me under the fig tree. Something happened underneath that fig tree that only Jesus knew, Jesus and Nathaniel. Because I have a feeling like Nathaniel, he was probably in a place like Jacob. But I could be completely wrong and that's okay. Verse 13. And behold, the Lord stood above it. This is above the ladder where the angels are going up and down. And said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give you and your descendants. Also, your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and the north and the south and in you and in your seed, notice it's not plural, it's singular. In your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go. And I will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. Here he thinks he's all by himself. And at this point, he has no relationship with God. 
And God finds him and speaks to him, speaks to him in a dream. This is a salvation experience for Jacob. And he's all alone at the end of his rope. He's got wreckage behind him and he's got unknown in front of him. I will tell you, that's a great place to be because God can do a lot with that. Our hearts are suddenly moldable. We're then found teachable. So God reaches down and actually speaks to him at this moment to have a relationship with him. God makes a presentation and he says, I am the Lord God of Abraham. In other words, he doesn't know him yet, but his ancestors have a history. And he says, I'm going to provide for you. I'm going to give you this land, north, south, east, and west. This is all going to be for you and your descendants. And by your seed, all the nations of the world would be blessed like the dust of the earth. He tells him he's going to his very presence is there and it's going to be kept there. He's going to protect him as he goes through. He's going to preserve him and he's not going to leave him until all these things are done. And he gives him a promise. I will never leave you or forsake you. Maybe you've heard that before. You know, when God makes a commitment to you, he will never let you down. We make commitments to him all the time and let him down. And he never withdraws our relation, our relationship. He may withdraw fellowship but he'll never withdraw that relationship. And I'm, I'm glad for that. Amen. So when did first God meet with you? I wish I could hear every one of your testimonies. When did God first meet with you? When did he say, I'm the God you've been running from. I'm the one that you've heard of, but you don't know. You know, that's, that's a story worth hearing. Amen. And I'll bet there are people in your life that don't even know it. God reaches down and initiates contact with Jacob, just like he did with you, maybe when you were at your lowest point. It's not a bad place to be. And Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. Notice he says the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. You wouldn't know it by looking at it. It's just a bunch of rocks and dust. And he was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. And Jacob rose early in the morning and he took the stone that he had put at his head and he set it up as a pillar and he poured oil on top of it and he called the name of that place Bethel. But the name of the city had been called Luz previously. It's interesting. I believe every single word in God's word is specifically written there for our learning because the Bible says so. It's interesting. The name of the town used to be Luz, which means separation, which is exactly how J Jacob felt. And now he renames it the house of God because God was in this place and I didn't know it. You know, when you're on the, <laughs> on the bottom of the barrel, and you don't think God's anywhere around, he's there. Right. You just don't know it. And he's doing something. You just might not know what it is. It's a good place to be. So Jacob says, I'm going to remember this place. I'm going to memorialize this place. And he takes the stone that he was lying on as for his pillow, and he stands it up, and he pours oil on it, and he makes an altar. He makes a memorial. And he renames the place. And it's actually a hill. It's one of the higher hills in, um, in Israel. Uh, it's not the, the Temple Mount, but it's, it's one of the higher hills that are there and renames it. And from then on, it becomes a memorial. Where did God meet with you first? I wonder if you have that in your mind as a memorial. Where, where I met with God was in a gas station, in the parking lot of the gas station, in a 69 Camaro in the passenger seat. with a man of God telling me that I needed Jesus. And I was finally at the end of my rope and ready to listen after I had been up for two days straight. And I let go. I said, God, if you're there, you got to show me you're real and you got to make yourself real to me. And he did. And he changed my life from the inside out. 
I hope you understand what that's like. I hope you understand what it is to meet God and for him to say, listen, I'm the God you've heard about and you've been running from, but I will be with you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. He says, I will never leave you or forsake you, says the Lord. That's Hebrews 13, 5. And then Jacob made a vow. Whenever you have an emotional moving experience, of course, you're always moved to make a vow, right? <laughs> you're eating. It's a fine meal until you begin to get ill and you begin to turn green and you run to the bathroom and you vomit. It's an emotional experience. At that point, you make a vow. I will never come here again. Perhaps you've had that experience. Or you try to help somebody or do something kind and do something loving for someone and it gets turned back. You go, that's it. I'm never asking a girl on a date ever again. I'm swearing off of women. You always have to watch when people make vows because it can be an emotional experience. I want you to read the words of this. Then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me, and keep me in this way that I am going, and give me bread to eat and clothing to put on, so that I come back to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone which I have set as a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will surely give you a tenth. God... If you get me out of here, if you'll just do this thing for me, and oh yeah, and give me some food, and give me clothing, and get me back home without my brother killing me, then you will be my God. Well, didn't he just say, I am your God? <laughs> didn't God just say, I'll take care of you? Didn't he say, I'll preserve you? Didn't he say all that stuff? And he goes, well, if you do that, then I'll serve you, and now I'll give you a tenth. I'll give you a tenth of everything I get. Have you ever done that? Like a foxhole prayer? God, if you just get me out of this, I'll never, I, I, think, of a, I think of an old Burt um, Reynolds movie where he was dying, he was diagnosed, and he tried to hire Dom DeLuise to kill him. And so he decides, because this guy's an idiot and can't kill him right, he's going to go drown himself. And so he swims out into the middle of the ocean, and he just goes down, and he just decides he's going to die. And in the middle of the movie, he pops up, and he goes, I want to live! Except now he's, he's way, way out in the middle of the ocean. And he starts praying to God. God, I want to live. I don't want to die. If you get me out of here, God, I'll give you 50% of everything. And nobody gets 50%. And I'll go to church. And I'll be good. And, I'll, and he's like telling God all these things he's going to do. He goes, just make me a better swimmer. And so he's swimming. He goes... I think I might make it. I think I might make it. Lord, as soon as I get out of here, I'm going to give you 10%. <laughs> I know. I know I said 50%, Lord, but I'll work my way up. And, you know, I'll, I'll think about going to church. And, you know, and he starts, and suddenly he gets onto the shore. And suddenly all the things he said when he was in the middle of his trouble have all been backed off. It's funny. We cry out to God when we need things, when we're absolutely at the end of our ropes, when we should always, in every way and all the times, be speaking to him and offering him our lives. And we'll never get into that place. This is Jacob's first chance to have a conversation with God. And he has this whole conditional vow. Or at least that how it appears when you first read it. The beauty of being able to study the Bible and not have to go do something else is I get to actually look at the original language and how it was written. And there are two things that you need to know. Number one, there's a difference between a subjunctive and an indicative. A subjunctive means, if you do this, then I'll do that. Which appears as though he's saying that. If. But if you remember, when the devil came to Jesus and tempted him. He says, 
if you're the son of God, speak to these stones and you can make them into bread. He says, if you're the son of God, jump off of this place because the angels will come and get you. He said, if. It's actually a, 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 a very uh, inaccurate translation because it's not if you're the son of God, it's since you're the son of God, you will be able to do all this. So this is an indicative, not a subjunctive. A subjunctive is, if you do this, then I'll do that, God. But this is a declaration. He's not saying, God, if you do these things, then I'll do these things. He's saying, since God, you will be with me and keep me in this way that I'm going and give me bread. And he's saying, since you're going to do all what you just said. It's not if. You have to be careful when you're reading that you don't see something that isn't there or try to jam your own uh, experience of, of watching the end with <laughs> Burt Reynolds in it and push it into the scripture. You have to see what it actually says. He's saying, since God, you will be with me and keep me in this way that I'm going and give me bread and eat clothing to put on so that I come back to my father's house in peace because he said he would. Then the Lord shall be my God. In other words, he's making a commitment to God. I will accept you as my God. You're gonna, you're gonna be it. And this stone which I have set as a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth to you. You see, he's making a declaration of faith in this God who's come and contacted him. And it's just one little word. I find these things exciting. So, Romans 12, 1 and 2 comes to mind. He says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Jacob's making a declaration. He's giving his life. He's saying, since you're going to do all these things, you're going to be my God and I'm going to follow you and I'll give you a tenth and I'll, I'll do whatever you tell me to do. I'll go wherever you want me to go. He's had a born again experience in an Old Testament sense. Amen. He's had a meet with God. In Isaiah 48 too, a familiar promise. When you go through deep waters, I will be with you. I don't know if you see this little character right here but that's me. <laughs> or maybe that's you. God has made a promise through Jesus Christ that all the promises of God are yes and amen. And sometimes we walk around in an arid land with nothing but rocks and dust and we wonder where's God. Well, he's in this place. He's in this place. He's in your car. He's in your home. He's at your job. Hard to believe. He's not located to any one location. There's another picture of Bethel where Jacob meets with God, a place where there was a memorial. And there's also a whole history of it. Don't want to ruin that. And so he's running away and was found by God. It's a great, great story of how God came to Jacob and saved him. Next week... There's only 24 verses. That's it. You know, sorry. It's a little bit of a love story next week because he's actually going to gain a wife or two or four. And what Jacob, who is a deceiver up to this point, has just met with God, he's now going to learn a lesson about the birth order and about being deceptive. There are all sorts of things that he's going to learn about this. But if you'll notice in verse 11, it says, Now Jacob kissed Rachel and lifted up his voice and wept. Ladies, I don't know how you've uh, met your mate, but this is how he met his. And he kissed her and then fell to his knees and he cried. I don't know how she felt about that. If I kissed my wife and she fell to her knees and cried, I'd be like, oh, no. I know I've done something. I just don't know yet. 
We're going to look at the love story and about how God brings two people together and about how we learn that we shouldn't cheat people because getting cheated is not a good thing. 